Hello and welcome. How deeply have gambling and corruption eaten into the world of cricket? The sport known as the gentleman's game has suffered another body blow to its credibility with the latest scandal unfolding in England. The International Cricket Council suspended three Pakistani players for allegedly taking bribes to bowl no balls at predetermined times during last month's test match at Lord's. A British newspaper secretly taped a London-based Pakistani businessman accurately predicting when those no balls would be delivered. It's called spot fixing, where gambling syndicates make money from people who bet on specific move, uh, moments of a game rather than the result of an entire match itself. And this is the latest in a long line of scandals that has dogged international cricket for more than a decade now. So today we ask, as cricket becomes a multi-billion dollar global sport, how can it be protected from gambling and match fixing? Remember, you can send us your questions and comments uh, through SMS or email. Well, joining us from Islamabad is retired Pakistani cricket superstar Imran Khan, who led his country to its only World Cup win in 1992. And from London, we have the former England Test cricketer Chris Cowdery, who's now a professional sports commentator. Gentlemen, I welcome you to the show. And Imran, uh, it's a sad situation to be having to talk about this, uh, this you know, affecting Pakistani cricketers in this way. I was surprised, though, to hear in the media you saying that spot fixing shouldn't be considered as bad as match fixing, that players shouldn't be banned. I mean, surely uh, corruption is corruption in, in any form. Well, Riz, <clears throat> it's like first degree murder, second degree murder, and so on. Um, you know, a match fixing means that you are taking money to lose a match. So that should be a life ban. But spot fixing means, uh, of, from what I gather from, um, you know, as you talked about bowling no balls at a predetermined time, you don't necessarily affect the outcome of a match. It's still a crime, a big crime. But it's, it's not like you're taking money to lose a test match or a one-day match. Although so, um, a game, a game, can, a a game can fall and lose on, on one ball, though, can't it? In a test match, I, and we're talking about the test match, I don't know how <clears throat> prevalent this crime is. Uh, I mean, this could go on. I mean, for all I know, this could be prevalent everywhere because it is almost impossible to detect uh, when someone has bowled a no ball uh, because he's got a signal from the bookies or it's, it's just he's made a mistake. So it's impossible to detect that. But if it's in a test match, a no ball, or a, or a batsman playing a maiden over, which was the other allegation, it doesn't necessarily affect the outcome of a, of a test match. So therefore, it's not really as big a crime as one of the things that has come out in the News of the World article that Pakistan team actually uh, lost a test match in Australia in Sydney uh, by taking something like uh, around a million dollars. Now that is a serious crime. I that I should be a life ban. Right. I want to put an email to you we got from Pakistan from Mohammed Bilal Awan who wrote in saying it's been an ongoing international agenda to make Pakistan a failed state in every way. This cricket scandal is another attempt to victimize Pakistan yet again. It's really a, it's, it's a very sad situation for Pakistan, A, to be struggling with an, a very terrible image in the West as, you know, the hub of uh, terrorism. And then uh, we also have the, the floods and the, the disaster taking place. And now this on top. And I wonder really what this is doing for the morale of, of Pakistanis. Well, I can say that First, the war on terror, uh, Pakistan had nothing to do with 9-11. It got, uh, uh, it, we were pushed into this war by a dictator unilaterally, where army was sent into Waziristan. No Pakistani was involved in 9-11. And so we ended up uh, uh, having a, basically a civil war in Pakistan, and we have more terrorist attacks in this country now than any other country. But before 2004, until we were forced into this war by a dictator, we had no suicide attacks in this country. Last, time, last year, we had 500 blasts. So, and on top of it, the, the humiliation of being every Pakistani, when he goes abroad with a green passport, he's sort of almost a suspect. Right. So that, is, that has been a big blow to our morale, followed by the floods where, where right. our government was perceived to be so corrupt that people would not give it money. You know, th that's pretty humiliating. And I think that's why the timing of this match-fixing scandal has been probably so demoralizing. I can't imagine an incident that caused such demoralization right. in the country as, as this match uh, spot-fixing scandal. Okay, let me bring in Chris Cowdery. And Chris, thanks for being with us too. And, and I wonder where you see the problem lying in the game. Why have the betting uh, syndicates become so influential in this game? 
Well, uh, you have to say money talks. Um, on, on Imran's point there, I would just say that this is nothing personal uh, in relation to that email. This is nothing personal against Pakistan. I really, I really believe that, that it, it's not a personal thing. I think it's, it's tragic the time that this has happened, uh, bearing in mind the country going through such a, th such a hard time. But on the, on the point before about the, the, the spot fixing as opposed to the match fixing, um, Imran said it's a big crime, but it's not as big as match fixing. You know, there, there's one side that can look at that. But on the other hand, it's a massive crime, uh, even more massive crime, when you think of the sort of money that might have been uh, put, bet on that particular delivery. And that's when you think of the people that could have gone down over that. The bookmakers, you know, a lot would have made a lot of money, but a lot would have lost a lot of money, and it shouldn't be part of the game. And that, the problem is that money at the end of the day talks, and a lot, of, a lot has been made here of how little the Pakistan players have been paid to come over here, and clearly they become a target. Cricket becomes a target because they don't get paid so much, the cricketers, as much as the footballers over here. So generally, you don't see match fixing um, in football and in some of the other sports. But cricket is a prime target, and right. it's very, very difficult to detect when it's going on. Now, I'll, I'll get on to some of the, the other factors affecting this in a moment, Chris, but let me, let me talk about the nexus between cricketers and uh, betting syndicates that were first revealed 10 years ago. Now, some of its the most high-profile stars were found guilty of corruption. For example, South African captain Hansi Kronia was banned for life after he confessed to taking bribes. And we had the former Indian skipper Mohammed Azruddin, who was also banned for life uh, on allegations of match-fixing. And the Pakistani batsman Salim uh, Malik was slapped with a life ban for his involvement with bookies, although that ban was uh, overturned you know, eight years later. Now, I wonder, it, it's funny that English and Australian cricketers seem to have been out of this sort of loop in this sense why is it that they don't seem to be so much affected by these allegations and issues yeah well I think it's um, maybe they don't do it is, is one point I mean there, there is a, a point to be said for that that maybe that uh, the England and the Australian players who get paid a little bit better they're not such an easy target there is something to be said for that maybe you, you read all the time people saying it's not in their culture uh, for the English and the Australian. I don't really buy that. I, I think that generally, um, I think probably it, it, it is something that uh, English players uh, have been accused of. There's no question that in the past names have, have risen to the surface. I don't think, funnily enough, uh, too many Australians have. But, uh, but I think the problem is that every time there is trouble, I think where people go looking for trouble, they go into the Pakistani camp where they feel it's prevalent and they catch somebody. I don't believe that anybody's particularly tried to catch anyone from Australia or England. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's prevalent through the game, I'm not sure. Imran, there was an email that came in from South Africa, if I could put this to you. It's, it's from Mohammed Sid, uh, Sidat Chasawala, who says, cricket can be protected from this degree of corruption by increasing the amount of sponsors which would generate more money for players. The ICC should look into this. Now, of course, uh, I mean, the, the amount that cricketers earn uh, has gone up dramatically. I know in, in India now there are some, we're talking millions for cricketers uh, at the very top of the game. And, and I wonder if that's one of the factors with Pakistan, of course, not being allowed, for example, to play in cricket since the attacks in, in Mumbai, uh, whether it's, it's the, the economics that have been driving some of the players towards this direction. <coughs> Riz, you know, I'm afraid I don't buy that. Greed is greed. It's a problem in the mind. It's got nothing to do with your bank balance. This idea that, you know, because players are not getting paid enough, uh, I, in, I played 21 years of international cricket. I made less money than one mediocre test cricketer playing IPL would make in one month. So. Money is not the reason for this. When there was no, in my 10 years of captaincy, there was never any question of uh, any allegations of match fixing. I left in 92 and 93 this started in Pakistan. Uh, 93 was the first time there were match fixing allegations and investigation. I think it's, it's got to do with the moral character of the person. If you do not have uh, a strong morality, you will be swayed by them. Obviously there's a lot of money, and especially in the subcontinent, there's very, uh, the, the most amount of gambling on cricket takes place in the subcontinent. And I remember that in Sharjah, when you used to play in Dubai, there was, m while we were playing, there was m millions exchanging hands on, on betting per, per ball. So there, clearly there were then also these bookies must have been targeting players, but, but nothing ever happened. I think uh, the bookies get through to certain players who they know are prone to this. 
perhaps who, who, who like gambling or perhaps they think that they are, they are vulnerable. And I think that's how they get in. Pakistani players make more money now than ever in our history. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's, so it's, it's not related to uh, the amount of bank balance you have. Chris is, there, Chris, is there an issue with, with authority then? Is it that the ICC doesn't have the kind of powers it needs to, to make sure this doesn't become as prevalent or widespread as, as it seems to be becoming? Is it a lack of authority that's uh, failing us? I think, no, I think they have the authority. I think they have the authority now. They might not have done in the past, but they do now. They have the authority to, to act on this, but they, always, they are always very frightened of the legal implications of all this. And as far as I'm concerned, they didn't put in place when they should have done, after the Hansi Cronier affair maybe, they should have put in to world contracts. Every single player that signs a contract to play for his country needs to have a contract that is really, really big on this subject. Any form of match fixing, spot fixing, whatever it may be, should eliminate that player and, and could be sub subject him to a life ban. And I believe a life ban would be a, a, some sort of deterrent for some of these players. The other thing is that you, they should have added to it, in my view, is that if a player goes down the match-fixing route, he, is, he may well put his country in jeopardy from playing well cricket. Now, if you can imagine, say an Indian player at the moment, India are running well cricket to, to all intents and purposes. Imagine an Indian player having in his contract that if he took a bribe of any kind to, to match fix a game of cricket for his nation, that his nation would be taken out of world cricket for a year. Can you imagine that? Or an English player, it doesn't have to be India, an English player just before the ashes. Suddenly mm. England are taken out of the ashes. The prob that should be in people's contracts and, and there should be a major deterrent for players. We have to take a short break now. When we return, what more can be done to protect international cricket from corruption and match fixing? We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. The ongoing Pakistan cricket team's tour of England has made news for all the wrong reasons. Some Pakistani players have been accused of taking money from gambling syndicates to underperform, and that is again raising questions about the magnitude of corruption in international cricket. My guests for the show are well-known former all-round cricket star Imran Khan, who captained his country to its first ever series win in England and in India, and retired England cricketer Chris Cowdery, who led his country in a test match against the West Indies. Now, Imran, uh, an email, if I may, from India that came in from a viewer by the name of Sanjay Sethi, who wrote in saying, a New Delhi court argues that betting in cricket and other sports should be legalized in India, saying it will help the government track the transfer of funds and use the revenues for public welfare. Is, it, is this possible to turn crooked betting into public good? What's your opinion? Well, Riz, uh, just res responding to what Chris said, mm -hmm. I agree that you know, it should be a deterrent. Anyone caught match fixing, spot fixing, there should be a deterrent for future generations of cricketers. But let me say it is almost impossible to detect it. How do you know that a bowler has uh, bowled a no ball by taking money from the bookie or not? Uh, I mean, no balls are part of cricket. Uh, how do you know a batsman has played a maiden over uh, because the, the, he's got a, uh, you know, uh, 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 he, uh, on, on the orders of a bookie? He sold, so it's not possible. And when you look back in cricket, Hansi Cronia was just caught by chance. It was no cricket investigation that caught him. Uh, it was by chance the, uh, the police were tapping someone's phone, some uh, murder sus suspect, and this somehow managed. It, Hansi was in the same hotel, and they caught him speaking to a bookie. It was completely by chance. And even now, the spot fixing, again, a news of the world sting. It was no cricketing investigation that caught these people. I, I mean, now, when, when, when I hear of the spot fixing, and if these allegations are true, then I mean, I'm suddenly thinking, how much more of it goes on? And how do you catch it? So um, the, 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 the big problem the cricketing world faces is, how do you find out about spot fixing? Uh, which is much more difficult to uh, catch than match fixing. Match fixing, at least, you know, you can see a team. I mean, I look back at the Sydney Test match where Pakistan lost. And I, it was impossible to lose the test match. So now someone like me who understands cricket, I'm thinking that, God, did they really throw it? 
What about the cricketing public? How is it going to know when, if, if these allegations are proved, how does the cricketing public decide when is a match thrown and when, when has the team lost? Mm -hmm. If someone like me starts doubting it, who understands cricket, how, how does the ordinary cricket uh, spectator know when a game is, is, is okay. thrown? So it is, I'm afraid this has quite long-term repercussions. Okay. We don't know how much of it goes on. We will suspect a lot of times whether a match has been uh, genuinely lost or fixed. Now, a quick thought on that email then, Imran. Uh, in terms of uh, making betting legalized in a country like India, where perhaps it being undercover, being black market, uh, actually probably encourages a, an environment of corruption, do you think that legalizing it, do you think bringing everything above board might actually help the game? But how is it going to uh, uh, affect match fixing? I mean, yeah. it, you know, betting would be legalized, but that still means a bookie can make a lot of money uh, if, he, if, he, um, if he comes to an understanding with one cricketer or okay. a team. All right, Chris, uh, that's an interesting thought uh, that Imran has raised here. How, how is it policed? How is it possible to know what is a genuine, uh, you know, a slack play, if you like, as opposed to a, a thrown uh, game? Well, th this is uh, the Chris, point. This, this one is the thing major, major issue. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Imran. Chris, can I just say one thing? You know, there was a news of the world sting on the ex-Pakistani captain, Salim Malik. Now, he talked about, in that sting, in the news of the world article, this is about eight, nine years or ten years back, he talked about a final of a one-day match played in Sri Lanka where both teams had been bought by the bookies. So both finalists were trying to lose the match. It was <laughs> hilarious. Apparently, both were trying to lose the match, one trying to outdo the other. Now, so, uh, and, and I only knew about it when it came out in this, uh, in this News of the World article. Mm -hmm. Now, it's clearly that this happens. Tied, we don't know how match. much. Yeah. We don't know <laughs> when. So, so, Chris, what's your view then on, on policing <laughs> it? What Eventually, what? <laughs> uh, my view, my view on that one is, if it was a tied match, they would have both won the money. I think, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but on, you're right. How do we ever find out? And and I think what what has to happen. I mean, w England sent over Paul, uh, Sir Paul Condom, who from the uh, the police uh, over here, the Metropolitan Police, and you know they they looked at all this for months and months and months, years in fact, and he came back and said. It's a very hard game to, to detect anything. Of course it is. It's a long game and certainly spot fixing. The no ball thing, uh, as Imran said, y y it was pure chance that someone from the News of the World decided to get involved and they came across this guy and allegedly these things happened. But the fact is that's the only time when you will get any real evidence. And that is the problem. Over the years when people have been accused and a lot of people have been accused, it's gone to a sort of, I don't know, some sort of kangaroo court somewhere and they've come back and said inconclusive. We cannot prove in a court of law that this fella has actually taken a, taken a bung and it's a, a match fixing situation. Where you get a situation maybe with tampering of the ball where, where on film, on camera, you can see a player putting a bottle top into a ball, say, or whatever, you know that that is breaking the law, and you can prove it in a court. Mm -hmm. But when it's this match fixing, it's a very dangerous business. And, and going back to that Sydney Test match um, that Imran talked about, I mean, everyone over here is talking about the wicket keeper who took an ordinary ball just above the bales. All he had to do was take the bales off, and Australia were pretty well gone and Pakistan were going to win that test match and for him to miss the bales by so far now what happens then is everybody says he must have been match fixing he must have taken a bung somehow everybody's convinced of it but can you prove it wasn't human error can you just pr mm. prove that he didn't just miss the bales these things happen it shouldn't happen to a professional sportsman and Imran will tell you mm. a, a wicket keeper with a ball in his hand who's a professional international player Missing the bales from two inches away is pretty unusual. Imran, you, so you raised an interesting. How do, you yeah. how do you actually bring these people forward? Well, I was going to say, Imran, you raised an interesting point, saying the scale of it that we don't really know. Uh, tell me, in the, in the time that you played cricket, of course, you're a superstar in the, the cricket world and played for so long. Were you ever approached by the bookies? Well, I wish someone had approached me, Riz, but no one did. <laughs> uh, I did hear about, uh, <laughs> you know, once I was captain, there was one instance when I was told that uh, four of my players, it was the final of, of, of an Australasia Cup in Sharjah, and I, late at night I got a call from Javed Miyadad, and he told me that you know, he had heard that four of our players had been bought by the bookies. So 
I mean, that's the only time. And of course, I, I went to the ground and I said, look, I've heard this. And if I find anyone underperforming, I'd not just uh, have them banned from Pakistan, but have them put in jails. And so anyway, and we won the match comfortably. But that's the only instance. I think the bookies know exactly who, which sort of players are vulnerable. I think they do their homework before appro approaching players. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but one way, Riz, they can catch players is that they must somehow find out about bank balances of players. You know, they should, the players should be able to declare their assets when they come into the team. And, right. and, and so every bank balance should be declared. And so, you know, there's money put into Swiss banks and so on. Somehow that money trail should be followed. It's probably the only way. Okay. Because suddenly you would find a player making a lot of money. Well, Chris, a quick thought: to, Did the dark side of the game ever approach your uh, your career? Did you ever find yourself approached by bookies or encounter any of that stuff? N never ever. I heard about it happening all the time. Not in English cricket, but you hear about it in international cricket. There were rumours all the time. I was never approached. I wish someone had approached me and paid me lots of money to get out to Imran because I found it so easy <laughs> getting out to him anyway. Um, but it never never happened, unfortunately. Right. And can I just can I just pick Imran up on the word? He used the word jail a minute or two ago. I've got a big view on that. That I think if in business you go into fraud and and you are in a million pound fraud deal then you get put in prison. This, this match fixing in cricket is putting a lot of people in a very, very poor position. A lot of these bookmakers, mm. this is fraud. This is fraud. So what is the difference? Because it's sport, uh, and this is only allegedly, of course. If a right. player gets caught match fixing or spot fixing, it's fraud and jail should be an option. Well, gentlemen, I have to stop you there. Imran Khan, Chris uh, Cowdery, thank you very much for joining us for this debate. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook, see what we're up to there, and give us your feedback on shows and post your questions and comments. On the next show, caring for 9-11's first responders. As we approach the ninth anniversary of the World Trade Center attacks, we look at the plight of emergency workers who continue to suffer from chronic respiratory illnesses and more. Why isn't the U.S. government doing more for them? Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.